Um, it's a difficult act to follow, like standing between you and your lunch. So I'll try and uh, finish it uh, before the time so that you can have a nice lunch. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here. This is my first trip to Singapore. Um, and uh, it's been uh, like, um, it's been a, like I've come here yesterday morning and it's been a nice time from then on. Um, I'm going to be talking about the evolution of serverless, past, present, and future. Um, whenever you're trying to predict the future, it's always a very, very tricky thing. Uh, a lot of people got their fingers burnt trying to predict the future, especially with respect to technology. Let's see how I do. Um, so what we'll be doing uh, is um, first try and discuss a little bit about what is serverless, right? So there are, there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to serverless. Um, so we'll talk about them. And I'll take a brief peek into the past and see where we are today. And also we'll be looking at what my predictions for the future are. Um, and um, what would be the takeaways? Uh, yeah, I think one of the takeaways would be uh, the fact that when it comes to technology, a lot of things don't have a clear definition. Like, what does DevOps mean? Um, I mean, there isn't a single definition. I mean, we, if you give an example, you can think of whether it's DevOps or not. But what is DevOps itself does not have a precise definition as such. And that's true for a lot of things with technology. And I think that's one of the things which is true with serverless as well. Um, other than that, uh, one of the things I observe is that the adoption of serverless is increasing. So that's another thing that we would discuss. Um, another thing I really believe in is the fact that almost all cloud services and almost all cl architectures are heading towards serverless. So that's another thing uh, we'd be talking about. So we'll discuss these in addition to the other serverless trends I'm observing. Um, just a brief background about me. I'm Ranga. Um, I'm founder of In28 Minutes. I'm a very popular Udemy instructor. I have about a million learners on Udemy who are doing our courses on cloud DevOps programming. And yeah, you can connect with me on rangakarnam.com. Let's start with a few uh, kind of uh, jokes about serverless, right? So why did the serverless function go to the beach? Any guesses? Because it's already, because it's always running in the cloud, it needs some sun. Uh, why did developers switch to serverless? Yeah, this is actually true. <laughs> a lot of us are very, very tired of playing with servers. You don't really want to do, uh, manage softwares, uh, installations, your hardware. You don't really want to worry about that. Yeah, why was the serverless function feeling cold? Any guesses? I think it should be easy. <laughs> yeah, because it was running on a cold start. <laughs> um, I think this is something where AWS is putting a lot of effort into making it better. Uh, one of the recent features which is added in, Snapstat, uh, I think that really makes a difference when it comes to Java, uh, cold starts. Uh, but I think there is a long way to go uh, with respect to co cold starts. <laughs> yeah, how, how do you make a serverless function feel better? Any guesses? <laughs> Obviously, give it more hardware. <laughs> So give it more CPU, give it more memory. Uh, yeah, just a f so. Um, whenever we talk about serverless, there are a lot of misconceptions, right? The word itself, serverless, uh, it almost says that there are no servers. But when it comes to uh, the ground, your applications are running somewhere, right? Your applications are finally running on servers, whether you're making use of serverless or not. So that's kind of one of the most important uh, misconceptions about serverless. When somebody is starting with serverless, they would be thinking, hey, where are my applications going to run? Right? Serverless, it's not about uh, serverless, servers not being there, but it's something uh, a little different. Right? So uh, 
And another misconception uh, I uh, very, very frequently see is that a lot of people think we are past the wave of serverless, right? So if you look at uh, the entire journey of serverless, right, around uh, the time frame when Lambda was brought in, uh, that's when the word serverless became a little bit more, like, pronounced, more popular. Uh, and I think within a few years, like the 2020 time frame, 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, there was a lot of hype around serverless, right? So everybody was saying uh, everything will be serverless and so on and so forth. And none of them has actually materialized in the last few years. And now the buzz around serverless, it's not so much, right? So today, hardly anybody talks about serverless being uh, something really, really uh, big. So. That's another misconception, the fact that there is, uh, like, the, like, the amount of use of serverless is going down. So that's another misconception. Actually, in my view, uh, as we see a little later, uh, the amount of uh, use of serverless is actually going up. Um, a good case in point was Donnie's talk, uh, uh, Donnie's and Steve's talk earlier. Almost 80% of the services which were talked about were serverless. You had no instances. You can directly go in and play with them. You don't really need to create a server or an instance or any of that kind. So uh, that's another thing. Uh, so uh, another misconception I usually see is uh, usually serverless is actually linked only with compute, right? A lot of us think uh, AWS Lambda is the only serverless service, or AWS Lambda with API Gateway is a serverless service. But Actually, when it comes to serverless, there are serverless databases, data warehouses, right? So uh, services like SQS, SNS. So there are a lot of other things that you can do in a serverless approach as well. And um, another very important misconception I see is serverless is always cheaper, right? That's not, the, uh, that's not actually true. If you don't get your architecture right, then serverless can be much more expensive than going the server way. So that's another thing which we have to be really, really careful about. Right? So let's get to the first one, right? the first misconception about what is serverless. Right? So uh, for, like, whenever, whenever we want to deploy an application, typically like, if you go back a few years, what we would be thinking about is uh, what kind of server I would want. Uh, what kind of hardware I would want for that specific server? What do I want to install on that specific server? Right? So, the, so those are the important decisions we think about. How do you scale the application up? How do you uh, make it available? Right? So those are some of the factors that we think about before we even think about writing some code or thinking about the use case or things like that. So we, uh, we have to make a lot of decisions be before you get into the business logic and your code. So for me, Serverless is just a trend towards uh, taking your focus, uh, putting your focus into your code and your business logic, rather than focusing on the infrastructure. Right? So it's all about uh, trying to focus on your code, uh, on your data, or on your service, on the business logic that you're trying to implement, rather than focusing on where it would run and what is the infrastructure you'd need, how to make it highly available, how to make it highly scalable. So it's about shifting away some of the response, like AWS uses uh, this term a lot, undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? So if you are a insurance company or if you are a health company, right? So you'd want to focus on your uh, core business logic. You don't really want to focus on infrastructure. And for me, serverless is just a way where you can take the next steps, right? So you would want to focus on as much as possible on your uh, like on your business logic rather than uh, focusing on other things. And you want to uh, leave things like scaling, things like availability. You want them to be the headache of the cloud provider rather than uh, they become your headache. Right? So that's kind of how I see serverless. Uh, there are a lot of definitions out there. For me, serverless is just about giving as much responsibility as possible to the cloud provider. You don't want to worry about a lot of the infrastructure details, as many details you'd want to leave it to the cloud provider. That's like, uh, it's for me also serverless is not about, I mean, uh, it's not whether you are doing serverless or not. It's at the level, right? So there is a serverless scale starting from zero to 100. It's about where you are on that specific scale, 
there is no uh, like there is no 100% serverless at all so it's about how much responsibility you are giving away to the cloud provider that's where you would be grading yourself probably like in my view it's like you might be 80% serverless or 90% serverless but uh, it's not an absolute thing it's not a one or zero thing it's like when you are designing your architecture it's like depending on how much you are worrying about the servers there's a grade uh, i kind of think of it like that um, so for me actually serverless is kind of an operational model uh, where uh, you would actually uh, like you not worry about servers and one of the characteristics of these models is paying for use right you are not paying for number of instances you are actually paying for uh, the number of i mean the amount of consumption amount of memory you are making use of cpus you are making use of so you are paying for consumption rather than the number of instances which are present in there and i i kind of see that reflect uh, in this survey which was done uh, as well so this is actually a little older report this is not the most recent one this is ibm serverless in the enterprise 2021 report uh, where they are looking at uh, like they they have done a survey uh, uh, like among users of serverless on what are the benefits that were experienced so they have implemented like a number of enterprises and implemented serverless and what were the benefits that they have experienced i think one of the uh, most important benefit is reduction in amount of management effort that you need to put in i think that's exactly what's reflecting in there as well uh, the other improvement the other major improvement you can see in there is the improvement of application quality so uh, for me i think uh, the first three right so uh, in terms of uh, reducing the amount of management effort uh reducing uh, improving your application quality and also uh, having greater flexibility right scaling availability these are very very important so having greater flexibility i think those are the three main advantages when it comes to serverless architectures so for me serverless is about uh, reducing the responsibility reducing your responsibility uh, as much as possible and leaving things out like uh, leaving things which are undifferentiated heavy lifting to the cloud provider uh, it's about focusing on your business logic it's about focusing on your code or data and it's about paying for use and uh, i'm how many of you are aware of gartner hype cycle right uh, a lot of you so uh, a quick introduction to gartner uh, hype cycle basically uh, any technology kind of goes through this cycle right so you have a technology trigger where somebody says serverless right they introduce the term serverless and at the start within the first couple of years you would have the peak of inflated expect expectations basically uh, you would think uh, everything will be that right so uh, the same was the case with serverless as well so when serverless was introduced after a couple of years uh, we we were thinking everything will be serverless almost all architectures will be serverless right so after a little while what would happen is you'd start realizing the real use cases you'd think okay maybe this is not the right fit in this specific scenario so you'll identify you'll get more data i mean you would have implementations you'd get data from that and you would see where which are the right places to use a specific technology and that's where you would have uh, like the trough of disillusionment so it's basically like, uh, like after the hype comes the down and slowly we would go towards identifying the exact use cases where that might be the right scenario to use right so you see almost every technology go through this right so serverless uh, kubernetes for example docker so all these technologies goes through uh, this uh, hype cycle right so for me i think uh, with when it comes to uh, serverless we are somewhere in between the peak of inflated expectations and the trough of dissolution dissolutionment uh, especially because like i don't think the expectations are huge right now in the last few years the expectations of on serverless have went down um, and i think we are somewhere very near uh, here uh, and i would think uh, within a little while we would start uh, seeing the real benefits of serverless and um, when it comes to serverless like another typical misconception with respect to serverless is serverless is aws aws lambda right right aws lambda is where serverless terminology started uh, that's where a lot of us started hearing this word serverless uh, 
but actually serverless existed even before AWS Lambda and also today serverless is well beyond just compute right so uh, like you have things like DynamoDB for example right so whenever you'd want to make like typically when we talk about uh, databases earlier you need to create a server uh, you need to then create instances then you would be able to create your data in the server but when it comes to things like DynamoDB you can directly go in and create your database right so um, when it comes to for example a data warehouse right so a good example for a serverless data warehouse from the beginning is BigQuery right so when it comes to BigQuery Google Cloud BigQuery it's like uh, you can uh, uh, store as much data as you'd want and you'd only pay for the data you have you are storing right? so you'd pay for the data you store and you'd be paying for the queries you do of the data you'd be paying for operations and like you'd see that BigQuery is actually something which uh, is present from 2012 right so it's like uh, the term serverless was coined uh, from the time AWS Lambda became popular but for me the concept of serverless not worrying about servers at all focusing on your data paying for the volume of data paying for the operations that existed well before uh, DynamoDB a good example in AWS is AWS S3 right so AWS S3 was actually introduced in 2012 right even with AWS S3 you don't really create a server you'd actually create a bucket and you'd pay for uh, whatever you store in the bucket and you'd pay for the operations which are performed on the specific bucket so yeah the serverless uh, terminology itself uh, even though it started with AWS Lambda in my opinion cuts across almost all services right so you have function as service offerings like AWS Lambda you have similar services which exist in other services uh, other cloud platforms as well you have cloud functions in Google Cloud uh, you have Azure functions in Azure um, and also today like one big evolution with respect to serverless is the evolution towards containers right so early, uh, like uh, when AWS Lambda came in probably containers were not so big docker was not so widely used but today if you look at most of the services uh, uh, which are related to containers for example uh, ECS in AWS uh, now has a serverless version Fargate right so and it's improving every day similar to that almost uh, every other cloud platform also has a serverless way of running containers as well and like when it comes to databases you have things like DynamoDB which is serverless and uh, when it comes to data warehouses like Google Cloud BigQuery like Azure Synapse Analytics and also like uh, Redshift now has a lot of serverless features as well. well like one of the biggest challenges when it comes to data warehousing is managing the servers right so you have huge volumes of data to store and you want to query from it as well so yeah it, it's it's uh, like it's a space where like serverless makes a huge difference because you only want to pay for the data you're storing and whenever you want to execute the query you don't want to only pay for the uh, query execution you don't want to pay for all the servers which are present in there and that's something uh, which uh, we have a lot of improvement when it comes to AWS with respect to uh, Redshift and the serverless options which are coming in into Redshift uh, and also like another very very important area where uh, there's a lot of focus in serverless is application integration right so there were a lot of use cases that Donnie and Steve presented to us related to application integration right so we looked at uh, the integrating AWS services and we also looked at how to integrate SaaS services with AWS and one of the key things that we would have observed I mean it's kind of taken for granted right now is the fact that we are not worrying about like for all the services that we looked at earlier uh, we will be paying for consumption like once we create a flow you'll be paying for the number of executions of that flow or how much uh, like how many operations were performed and things like that and you would not be really paying for the servers themselves so like it's also like serverless is becoming more underneath the hood nowadays it's almost taken for granted kind of so we already looked at the uh, I mean we already talked about the serverless options for compute right so AWS Lambda AWS Fargate is the serverless uh, compute engine which works with uh, elastic container service and uh, AWS Fargate can also be used uh, with uh, elastic Kubernetes service as well and we also have a number of data stores which are serverless right so you have S3 EFS DynamoDB uh, you have RDS proxy which can actually integrate with RDS uh, Amazon Aurora is a very great good example of AWS Aurora serverless as well and you have Amazon Redshift serverless coming in as well and you have a lot of things uh, we already talked about a lot of these like we talked about event bridge earlier uh, 
like we talked about uh, the uh, like multiple like family of event bridge uh, and we have step functions sqs all these are good examples of uh, things which help us to uh, implement serverless and um, serverless architectures are also implemented in wide variety of use cases right so the typical uh, this is kind of the most popular architecture right so for building a, a most popular use case of serverless i think to build things like web applications to build uh, things like rest api so you have uh, a, you have your data stored in dynamo db which is exposed uh, which is like which a lambda function would be talking to and this would be exposed from something like a uh, api gateway or something like that right so, so this is one of the uh, popular architectures uh, when it comes to rest api with serverless aws lambda uh the other uh, like uh, architectures which are also possible are data processing architectures right so this is an example of actually uh, like you have nodes coming in and you don't want to store them to s3 and you don't want to do further processing based on uh, the nodes maybe you don't want to generate a pdf or things like that so those kind of things can easily be easily be done in a event driven style as well right so you have a object which is stored in s3 and you can have events triggered from s3 and you can trigger lambda functions or you can put messages in the queue and you can do a lot of processing after that uh, based on whatever is coming in so you can process uh, the biggest advantage over here is once you create the entire flow you don't really need to worry about scaling it or you don't need to worry about availability of it and things like that you can also implement uh, batch programs batch processing in a serverless way as well uh, in the previous session donny talked about event bridge right so in event bridge one of the new features which came in is scheduling right so you can schedule uh, like as soon as uh, you, so you can schedule something in event bridge uh, to trigger off your batch and you can process the entire batch in a serverless way as well um, yeah you have a number of other uh, things that you can do in a serverless way as well you can trigger off your machine learning workflows or you want to uh, do some processing on your uh, like uh, on your images and things like that you want to get intelligence from them so those kind of things also can be done in a serverless way so basically the serverless architectures uh, there are a wide variety of possibilities when it comes to serverless architectures and let's quickly look at some of the important trends with respect to uh, serverless so uh, right now if you look at the serverless market uh, it's i would say somewhere it's like the bottom is completely fragmented uh, and the top is consolidated i mean like uh, where there are very very few uh, players uh, i would say it's somewhere in between right so today like when it comes to function as a service offerings i would say lambda has a big advantage but when it when you talk about serverless in general i think it's somewhere in between and this is uh, from modern intelligence uh, survey and uh, you can see that there are a wide variety of use cases uh, where uh, serverless is being used again this is from the ibm serverless in the enterprise 2021 report you can see that it's used uh, across uh, different uh, domains and uh, as usual uh, like aws has a lead when it comes to uh, like the serverless adoption Uh, so you can see that uh, almost half the organizations in each cloud have adopted serverless uh, this is from the datalog datalog survey uh, like serverless survey uh, 2022 uh, so you can see that almost uh, 75% of the enterprises which are using aws have adopted serverless so like aws is leading the way in terms of uh, how many of its customers are adopting serverless um Uh, this is like uh, you can write your lambda functions in obviously multiple languages and uh, you can see that the two prominent languages which have a big lead are python and node js i think with this snapshot uh, with this snapstat feature probably java would improve but let's see let's uh, see how it goes but right now python and node are the leading languages when it comes to writing your lambda functions and uh, if you i mean whenever we talk about uh, like serverless it's kind of a flow so you need to integrate your lambda function you need to have triggers for your lambda function from somewhere and uh, you can see uh, that uh, like a lot of uh, like invocations uh, the most popular way to invoke lambda function is api gateway 
right? So today, I mean, one of the recent features which was introduced into AWS Lambda is the HTTP invocation, right? You don't really need an API gateway to invoke a Lambda, but still you'd see that actually uh, API gateway is the number one preferred option. Uh, the other one is through the queue, SQS. So you have a notification, you have a message coming into the queue and the Lambda function is invoked in response to that. Uh, the surprise in here is the event bridge, right? So event bridge is something which is pretty recent, I would say, uh, but still it's doing pretty well. A lot of Lambda functions are getting triggered from uh, event bridge as well. So, yeah, and one of the like, uh, other trends that we see in the last uh, year, like last, last couple of years, is a lot of enterprises are going container first. Right, a lot of uh, enterprises, like earlier it was cloud first, today it's like container first, right? So you'd see that a lot of container related uh, technologies are really loved, right? If you look at Docker, Kubernetes, these are really, really loved by a number of developers who make use of them. And that's exactly the trend which is reflecting when it comes to serverless as well. The number of services, number of offerings around containers with respect to serverless in each of the cloud platforms are growing. Right? And that's exactly reflecting with respect to uh, the adoption as well. So more than 35% of the container organizations use serverless. And the reverse is also true. A number of people who are going serverless are making use of containers as well, especially because today Lambda also supports uh, containers. So yeah, as we talked earlier, like, uh, I see that uh, with respect to serverless, we are somewhere in between, between the peak of inflicted expectations and trough of disillusionment. And I see uh, the adoption of serverless uh, growing further. And a lot of times we are making use of serverless unknowingly. Um, let's, uh, we have three more minutes, so let's get to the predictions. Um, yeah, this is a famous prediction by somebody who's very, very popular, much, much more popular than me. Uh, and he said 60, 640K needs to be sufficient for anybody. And this uh, phone in here today have, has uh, more than 64 gigs of memory, right? So it's like uh, predicting is very, very difficult. Uh, yeah, this is something which we are already observing, right? So almost, like I would say serverless would become mainstream and a lot of times you would not even uh, think about serverless as something specific, right? A lot of services you would make use of are serverless underneath. And that will be the trend going forward. Um, probably, I think, uh, very, very soon, like it's been almost seven, eight years since the term uh, serverless was coined, uh, I think there would be a new name for serverless, right? So in technology, we have a way of actually doing the same thing and giving it a new name. And I, f I think uh, we will find a new name for serverless very, very soon. Um, almost all the cloud services would become serverless, uh, and yeah, and like with respect to containers, I think uh, like almost everything related to compute and serverless, I feel we would consolidate towards the containers way, right? So I, I think serverless containers will become uh, the norm. And obviously, another uh, factor where I think serverless services, I mean, serverless architectures and serverless flows can improve is with respect to the developer experience, right? So building serverless is not as easy as building uh, a usual traditional application, especially when it comes to debugging problems, right? So there are a lot of things that uh, we can do better when it comes to that. Each of the cloud providers is doing a lot with respect to that, but I think still uh, there's a long way to go with respect to improving the developer experience with respect to building serverless applications. Um, yeah, now, uh, like, my recommendations when it comes to, uh, like, how do you get much more knowledge about serverless? Uh, I love this serverless ICYMY. <laughs> uh, it's in case you missed it. Uh, this is something which is published on the AWS website uh, every quarter. And I love reading it. Right? This gives you a complete overview of what's happening with respect to serverless every quarter. And this is a great place to look at if you would want to explore serverless further or if you want to understand the history of serverless, how it evolved. Another great place to go is the AWS well-architected framework. Uh, the serverless application lens is a great place to go in and look at all the architectures that are possible with respect to serverless. Um, serverless land is another website I love. Uh, this is where a lot of patterns related to serverless are present. So you can actually see around uh, 400 
400 plus different templates with respect to uh, yeah, billing, getting started with your serverless architectures. And I love the Datadog survey. Like they have been publishing this for a few years now, and this is a great place to understand what's happening in the serverless world. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, like I, like uh, it's been, uh, like I think serverless is here to stay. We might find a new way to uh, like uh, express what serverless is, but I think serverless is something which will be here to stay for a long time. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, th uh, like first, I, I would I would want to thank the organizers, uh, Steve, Donny, uh, and Badri. Like thanks a lot. Uh, like you have helped me a lot in actually even uh, uh, getting a visa and coming in here. Uh, thanks a lot for all that. Uh, I hope you all have a nice session and uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>